I, I started a message on the Word of God, and we talked about the inspiration of Scripture and how God has had his hand on assembling uh, the books of the Bible. And then we talked about uh, last week the, uh, insp uh, the authority and uh, having faith and uh, in the authority of the scriptures uh, of the Bible. And this week we're going to look at, at a message that sometimes hasn't been preached uh, very often, but it's very much a part of the Bible. And so we need to look at it. And, then, and the title of the message is The Authority of the Believer. And uh, believe it or not, you have some authority in Christ uh, over powers of darkness. And uh, just to give you some groundwork for that, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. Take out your Bibles and read Ephesians or your phone or whatever you have it on, your tablet. We got iPhones and iPads and iKids and all kinds of things. <laughs> It starts out, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And all the parents said, amen. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and that uh, you may live a long life on this earth. And your fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are under your masters according to the flesh with fear <coughs> with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. So right there, he's talking about submission to authority. Kids, submit to your parents. Uh, those who are, have authority over you, you're, you're, you know, if you're, we don't have servant, uh, slaves today, but if you're working from somebody, you need to submit to them and their authority and and uh, do a good job, not when they're just watching you. So that's basically what, what he's saying there. Uh, with goodwill, verse 7, doing uh, service as unto the Lord, not unto men. So when you're working your job, you, you want to do it as unto the Lord. And uh, you want to do a good job. You don't want to uh, be reading your Bible during times you're getting paid. Say amen. <laughs> and knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive after, uh, of the Lord, whether be bond or free. And your masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there any respect of persons with him. And then he says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And, you know, we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. And your spirit is the part of you that connects with God. Your spirit is the part of you that God reveals his truth to. And, uh, and so you want to be strong in spirit. You want to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I often thought if we were able to project our spirit man up here on the screen, what would he look like? Would he be all malnourished and skinny and... You know, because he hasn't been fed the word of God for months. And, you know, and uh, so we have to be strong. You know, I mean, we know what it's like to be strong in the flesh. We, you know, you could work out and do all these things. But uh, being strong in the Lord means that you're, you're, you're feeding your, your inner man. You're, you're feeding them the word of God. You're exercising your faith. You're praying. You're expecting God to do things in your life. And you're building up your faith. And, uh, and you're building up and, and being strong in the Lord. Um, so be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the tricks of the devil. Now, <clears throat> a lot of us before we were saved didn't really know the devil exists. But once you got saved, then you you ran into some opposition because you were going against the stream. 
And uh, I remember a quote from Smith Wigglesworth. He said that after uh, one of his meetings, somebody come up and said, you know, I don't believe in the devil. And Smith Wigglesworth said, well, if you would resist him for a while, you would. <laughs> and that's the truth. Because you, when you got saved, you start resisting him and you found out that you have an enemy that's trying to uh, hinder your walk with God. So he, he's saying, finally, my brother, be strong in God and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. So you, you need some armor that you have to be able to stand against all the tricks of the devil. And, uh, and then it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness uh, of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there it is. There's a spiritual warfare going on. And whether you believe it or not, there is. I, I remember <clears throat> when I was in Vietnam, the, the worst thing you could do is forget that you were in a war zone. And Vietnam's a very beautiful country. It's, it's plush jungles and oceans, and we were on, on the ocean right on the beach there. And it's a beautiful country, but you can't forget there's people outside that wanted to kill you. And as Christians, we could just be cruisomatics and just keep cruising along and singing our songs and, and, uh, and fellowshipping and everything, but forget that we're in a war that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and uh, rulers uh, of darkness in the world against spiritual wickedness in high places, high places. So, you know, Revelation just says that when the devil's revealed, he's, he's gonna be the one that people see that he deceived the nations. So behind a lot of things that are going on in this world, is the powers of darkness. And so Paul is saying, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, <clears throat> as Christians, we have, we, we wrestle with all kinds of things. And I remember back in my early Christian life when I first got saved, there was a big thing about uh, uh, deliverance. And there were so many deliverance ministries. And we lived in a, in a, it was an old mortuary, believe it or not. <laughs> and my kids were little. We lived upstairs and we had a rehabilitation center and that we lived in. And uh, so we rented the main floor out every once in a while. And there was this group, um, they were a deliverance group. And uh, the head of it was a guy named Jim Pig. Go figure. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, and I, I was, uh, there was a balcony there, so I was, looking down and listening to them and watching them. And they all brought buckets in there, you know, and, and uh, they were talking to demons and people were throwing up and all kinds of stuff. And it was just weird, you know. But you, I, I, I believe that the biggest thing, the hardest thing that we face isn't the devil or spiritual demons, it's flesh. Uh, I think 85% of our, our battle is uh, is flesh, putting our flesh into submission to the word of God. And uh, there's, a, there's only two emotions that the Bible calls spirit, and that's uh, the spirit of fear and the spirit of heaviness, which is depression. And God's given us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and he's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. But the 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 other things we wrestle with is, is putting our flesh into submission and not yielding to the flesh, but to the spirit. But there are demonic powers that work in our, in our world and try and hinder our Christian walk. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against... <clears throat> We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I was watching this, docu uh, this uh, interview that Tucker Carlson had with the president of El Salvador. 
How many are aware of what's going on in El Salvador? God is just moving in a mighty way. This uh, president, I can't pronounce his name, I won't even try, but he's a young guy, probably, you know, late 30s or so, but um, he's got like a 92% uh, approval rating in his country. And when he started out, uh, he started out as a mayor in a couple uh, cities and just overturned, uh, just did tremendous things for those cities and the people just loved him. And then he ran for president and uh, they wanted to throw him in jail, the party kicked him out and everything else. Against all odds, he wound up being president. And he ran on the fact that El Salvador is, was the, the most dangerous place to live in the world because of the gangs. And he said that he was gonna uh, stop crime and murder in his country. And <clears throat> everybody thought he was crazy. But he's a Christian, he was, he's a man of God. And, uh, and he prayed and he start uh, going, he, he built this big prison, I mean a huge prison. And he start going after the gangs and, uh, and, and putting them in jail and they start fighting back. And, and then he, he got his uh, cabinet together and they all prayed for wisdom and God gave them wisdom. And they locked up 72,000 gang members. And you could go on YouTube and, and you know, President of El Salvador and look it up. It's just an amazing story. And when, when he told Tucker Carlson that they prayed, Tucker Carlson goes, you mean they, you prayed and the whole, your whole cabinet prayed? And yeah. And they were amazed. But that president <clears throat> understood this. He, he told Tucker Carlson that MS-13 was a satanic group was a demonic group. He said that they interviewed one of the guys who killed many people and uh, they asked him why he left the gang and he says because they started killing babies for no reason. And he said, when they asked, he asked them why, they said because the beast wanted a baby. And uh, so it was a satanic group and he said it made it easier for him to recognize that he was fighting against the powers of darkness because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. We sometimes just allow things to, to continue to plague us and to, and to nag at us, and we don't realize that we have authority over it and power over that thing. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of darkness, in this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. So because of that, because of that, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Take, you you got to take on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the blessed spirit of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the the shoes, and you got to have the whole works. And because you, you need it to stand against the powers of darkness. And then it says, having done all the stand, just stand. I mean, after you prayed, after you yelled at the devil, after you cried, after you sang hymns, after you've done everything, just stand. Just keep showing up. The devil hates that. And after you've done everything, just keep standing. You know, when the children of Israel were <clears throat> at the Red Sea and the, and the Egyptians were coming at them and the, the people were complaining to Pastor Moses, why'd you bring us out here? Now we're going to die in the wilderness and they're going to kill us all. And what did God say? He said, stand still and see the salvation of God. It's when we've done everything, when we prayed and fasted and nothing seems to change and we just, we just stand there, that's when God's getting ready to part the waters and bring you through. A lot of people quit before they see the salvation of God. 
Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Then stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and the blessed plate of righteousness. <clears throat> in other words, walk in right standing with God. If you mess up, get right. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith that you may be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith. I mean, you've got to use that all the time. When the devil throws things at you, man, in Jesus' name, that's a lie. God's word said, I don't have the spirit of fear, but I have the spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. How many know you need a sound mind every once in a while? <laughs> Stand therefore, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what church? The Word of God. The Word of God. You can't defeat the devil without the Word of God because Jesus had to do it. He used the Word of God to defeat the devil. He said, it is written. And um, that's why you have to know the Word of God. What's our memory verse for this month? Anybody? Don't look at your... <laughs> Anybody? Do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may be blameless, harmless sons of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Philippians 2, what's the first? Uh, 14, 15. So you have to know the Word of God because you might come into a, a place where you got an opportunity to the murmur and complain. <laughs> Somebody say, oh man, amen or oh me. <laughs> so we see there that, that there is a spiritual warfare or, otherwise, or else we wouldn't need armor. We wouldn't need armor if, there, if we're not in a war. There, there's a spiritual war going on. And so God has given us uh, power and authority to combat the uh, powers of darkness. And God will empower uh, his church for the battle. And uh, in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verses 4 and 5, it says, <laughs> Paul said this, and my speech and my preaching were not, uh, persuasive, were not by persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The church is an extension of Jesus' ministry. And in John 14, 12, Jesus said this, Most assuredly I say unto you, he who believes in me, how many believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay. This, and then I guess this is written to you. Most assuredly, I say unto you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. I remember I've seen a relay race where they pass the baton to the person waiting to run. That's what Jesus was doing there. He was passing the baton. And then in, in Mark 4, Mark 16, 15 through 18, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved, 
but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. In his name, they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That's in the Bible. Did you know that? Now, that doesn't mean we go around casting out devils out of dogs and everything is a demon. You know, we look, you know, long back in the 70s, everything, everybody was looking for demons in every place and everything. And, but if, if it comes up, and, and we're going to see here uh, where Paul had an instance of that, and, you know, he was able to cast out that spirit that was, that was uh, nagging and aggravating him and trying to stop the ministry. Um, and then <clears throat> in Philippians 2, 9, 11, this is key. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. His name is is above every name. It's above uh, the powers of darkness. It's above sickness. It's above every name that you can imagine. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of the things in heaven and the things in earth and the things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In Proverbs 18.10, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. There's, there's a song we used to sing, there's just something about that name. How many remember that song? Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. <clears throat> but there's something about that name. That was a powerful song. In Jesus' name encompass all truth, all the love of God, the victory of the grace, the visibility of God. It's honey to the taste, it's it's honey to the taste, harmony to the ear, and healing to the soul. If you have the name of Bill Gates, his name might open up doors for finances and stupidity. But I just threw that in. <laughs> Einstein may open doors of brilliance. Michelangelo may open doors of art. But the name of the Lord is holy. It's a holy name. And the name angels bow down and demons tremble. And Satan has to flee. In Acts 4.12, it says that <clears throat> neither is salvation in any other name, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's still true today. There's no other name in heaven that, uh, no, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jude, Jesus is the only name that people take in vain. The only name people swear by. The only name which produces love in the hearts of many who speak it. And it's the only name that can save us. No one says what Allah's name is going on. No one texts OMB, oh my Buddha. These facts help to prove <clears throat> the case that Christianity is the truth. And all else is false because only in Jesus' name has the power and the punch behind it to matter. 
And that, that just shows you that the devil is behind, you know, when people are cursing and using God's name in vain, it's just the devil inspiring them. And nobody taught them how to do that. It just came from the sinful nature. Let's look at Acts chapter 3. This is an instance where they used the authority they received in the upper room through faith in his name. And it came to pass as they went to pray, a certain da uh, damsel possessed with a spirit of div divination. Oh, I'm, that's the wrong one. I'm looking at. Look at uh, Acts chapter 3 real quick. Now, <clears throat> now when Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, a certain man lame, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask alms. He was asking alms, but wound up getting legs. And Peter fasting his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. Now, they just came from the upper room. They just received the power that Jesus said that when the Holy Ghost would come upon you, you shall receive power. And that just happened to them in the upper room. And so they, they come to this guy who's lame from, his, from birth and he's sitting there asking for money. <coughs> And Peter and John, they, you know, hey, we, we, we ain't got any spare change, man. You know, he, he said, Sil silver and gold, I, I don't have any. But such as I have, they, they realized they had something that they just got in the upper room. They just got filled with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> so as this man was looking upon them, and it says that he looked upon them, he gazed upon them, expecting to receive something. He, they, he was ready to get something from them. And, and they said, look on us, because we're about to give you something much better than silver and gold. And as he looked upon them, and expecting God to do something, or expecting something from them, he, they, they put his, their hand down and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he, he grabbed his hand and listen, the man went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. Does this still happen today? Is this for today? Is Jesus' name still as powerful as it was back then? Silver and gold. And you know what? <clears throat> the church has tried to replace the such as I have, give I thee with all kinds of entertainment. And I believe <clears throat> back in the early days of the charismatic move during the revival of the Jesus people and there was, there was a tremendous, I got saved through that revival. People were getting saved and delivered off of drugs. It was just, it was a miracle. And they weren't going into, you know, churches because they wouldn't receive, a lot of churches wouldn't receive them because they had long hair and they were barefooted and, and they just got saved and didn't know what was going on. So they, 
they had these coffee houses and and um, and just out of that grew you know different charismatic non-denominational churches but the power of God was there to set people free and to heal people and I remember many people that got delivered from drugs just by praying for them they didn't have to go through all kinds of recovery programs the power of God touched them and set them free but as the charismatic move kept going, you know, it got weirder and weirder and weirder. And pretty soon people start getting away from the gifts of the Holy Spirit because people start getting really weird, you know, barking like dogs and, and seeing gold dust fall from the ceiling, all kinds of weird stuff. That's why I say Christianity sometimes is like a circus. It is. I mean, I've been in this thing for 40 years and I've watched all kinds of side shows come down the road. <laughs> and, and they want you to jump on there, you know, and this one and that one and, you know, deliverance and this and that and all kinds of stuff. And you just have to stay focused, you know. And uh, so I, I believe that once they, they said, well, let's, Let's get away from the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's just put them in the closet for a while. And let's just start entertaining people. And then they start entertaining people with the lights and the fog and pastor coming in on a, on a wire, you know. I mean, I've seen that. And I, I've seen all kinds of dog and pony shows trying to entertain people and to draw people. And then they water down the gospel so that, you know, they felt they, they had to, you know, minister to the lost. And so they just, you know, watered down the gospel and, and uh, made everything palatable. I remember there was a time where they said, don't talk about the blood of Jesus because it's offensive and, and, uh, and all this stuff. I had a pastor say, well, what you have to do to grow your church is you got to turn the lights off and, and turn the music up, you know. And I'm thinking, does God need all that help? Have we lost the, the power and the anointing of God and we have to do these things to entertain people? And the Bible says that in the last days, men shall take heed to doctrines of devils and seducing spirits and having itchy ears. And so I believe that the churches have got away from the such as I have, give I thee, because of all the, you know, the, the abuse of it. But I want to tell you, I believe in these days, God is going to restore the such as I have, give I thee, to the church. As when we get closer to his coming, I think the anointing and the power and the revival is going to hit our nation once again. And I'm believing for that. Because people, you cannot reason with people today. Uh, you, it's got to be the Spirit of God touches their heart. And they have an experience with the Lord. And we see that happening in the book of Acts. And I believe God wants to restore that. So, and then in, in, um, in Acts 16, 16, it came to pass... As they went to pray, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her master much gain, but Susan. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men in service of the Most High would show us the way of salvation. In other words, she was mocking them and trying to disrupt their ministry. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit. He didn't say it to the person. He said it to the spirit. I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out of her. That was the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember when we <clears throat> were in the rehab ministry, uh, 
we had guys, six or seven guys, living with us full time. And we had a basement of the mortuary. And <clears throat> we took these guys in, and we were using Teen Challenge curriculum to run them through a program. And I remember this one guy, Jim. He was huge. He was big. I mean, he could have kick-started a 747. He was big. And um, he came into ministry, and he, he was just always aggravating people. He'd throw people down the steps, you know, and, and we found a gun on him and everything. And, and, uh, and you know, he was, every time we had a Bible study, he would interrupt and laugh and make fun. And uh, I remember sitting in that Bible study and he was doing his thing and the Spirit of God rose up in me and I could still see his face today and I just reached over there and I put my hand on his forehead and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to be quiet and he fell off of his chair and his eyes got about that big. Now, I didn't get out my book on demon possession and, and uh, who was that guy that was really big on, uh, yeah, he was one and there was another guy, I can't think of his name. But I didn't do that. There was just, there, the spirit of God rose up in me and I felt the power and the anointing and I, I moved and, and see, that's when, that's when that stuff happens, can happen to you. When, when things are, or stuff comes up and, and you don't understand it and you just, it's, it's bothering you and you just rise up maybe in your prayer time and you say, in Jesus' name and by the blood of the Lamb, I command you to, to loose that person in Jesus' name. And you take authority. And it, it's not you know, that you're a great demon stopper, but it's just the power of God wanting to be released through you and taking authority and putting the devil in his place. Those who believe shall receive power. How is spiritual authority through Jesus' name imparted? The Hebrew translation for Jesus is Yeshua meaning Jehovah is salvation. It was a common name among the Jews throughout the gospel. The name of Jesus Christ, Christ meaning the anointed one, the Messiah. The title is the order of the experience they had with him. They knew him first as Jesus, which was a common name, but later learned that he is the Christ, the Messiah, and the resurrection. But all the letters refuse to him, all the re letters refers to him as Christ Jesus, the anointed one. Paul came to know him as the risen Lord and Savior, the exalted one. There is only one true Christ, the Messiah. To have spiritual authority, now this is important. To have spiritual authority, you must be under authority. You must be under authority. In Matthew 8, 5 and 10, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there he came unto him a certain a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievous tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will go to him and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am man not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority. So he under, this man understood authority. Having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goes, and he goeth. <clears throat> to another come, and he comes. <clears throat> Do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, Jesus heard this man understood the principles of being under authority, he marveled. <coughs> he marveled. In 
And he said, I have not found so great a faith <coughs> in all of Israel. He called it faith. <coughs> James 4, 7. This is a very important verse. Submit, put yourself under the authority of God. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. Put yourself under God's authority. Resist the devil. How many know what resist means? You just don't go courting that lady of sin. Don't let her get her hand, chains on you. <laughs> the Bible says, Proverbs, a man cannot hold fire unto his bosom and not be burned. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. And what will happen? He will flee from you. Wow, that's pretty easy, ain't it? I mean, you know what I mean? I don't have to yell at him until I'm blue in the face. No. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Satan, I resist you in Jesus' name. Get your hands off of me or my family. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. He will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you devil-minded. So there's deliverance in a nutshell. Submit, resist, and draw nigh. Submit, resist, and draw nigh. You have to submit to God. That means you have put yourself under the authority and stand firm against the powers of, F, of the enemy. Draw close to God and he will draw close to you. Psalms 91 is a promise with a condition. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He that dwells, that means you live there under the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. When you're under somebody's shadow, you're pretty close to them. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. Is, is God your refuge? Is, is he the place that you run to every time you, you need something or you're, you're facing something? Is God your refuge or, or is, is alcohol your refuge or is, is uh, eating your refuge? Or, you know, there's many things that can be our refuge when, we, when we're going through stuff. Some people sleep, you know, but is God your refuge? Is God is my refuge. He's the place I run to. He's a very present help in time of trouble, the Bible says. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. How many can say this morning that God is your refuge? He, he's your refuge. He's your place you go to. He's your go-to place. He's my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the father and the, and the noise of the pestilence. He shall cover me with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. In other words, he's, he's like a, 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 you know, a, a chicken with a, a hen with his wings covering his chicks. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by noonday, nor the pestilence that walk in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thy eyes shall thou see and behold the reward of the wicked.
You know, one thing I forgot to mention about that prison that has 72,000 gang members in it. Well, for one hour a day, they get out and they kneel on the floor in the center of the hall. And you know what they do? They sing hymns. Gang members. They make them sing hymns. Now, you could see all this. You could find all this on YouTube. But that man, the president, knows that it's a spiritual battle. And what can change the heart of an MS-13 gang member? The power of God. The silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Sherry, you have a testimony. Come on up here. How many remember two weeks ago we prayed for her? Off and on for a month, I was in extreme pain, laying on the floor, just crying. And you guys prayed for me, and those next two days were terrible. I was in so much pain, I couldn't stand it. And I told David, God's either got to heal me or let me go to sleep and not wake up because I can't take it anymore. So I cried out to God. And then a week later, I went and had a scope done this Tuesday, and I have a ulcer that's a little bit bigger than a silver dollar, and I have an infection in my esophagus. But the day that I told God that I couldn't take anymore, I went to sleep, and when I woke up, I woke up pain-free, and I haven't had any pain since. Good job. But that was before the test, and that was before I started taking medicine. And there's no medical reason that I should have stopped having pain like I did, other than God took it. So. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we're not against doctors and getting help and going to see the doctors. We're, I'm all for that. But I gotta, we have to believe in the such as I have, give ID. We have to go to God first. And, uh, and you know what, I, I believe that as we honor that and we do that, we're gonna see the power of God move in, in our lives, in our church. God has given us power. You have spiritual authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. A lot of stuff that you've faced that are uh, just nagging you and aggravating you are sometimes uh, spiritual battles. And you have to get alone with God and get in prayer and tear down principalities and powers. You know, don't you don't have to... I mean, it, the best time to do that is in your prayer closet when nobody else is around. <laughs> and you pray and you rebuke and you tear down and, 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 and that's when God, the Spirit of God moves. But <clears throat> you have authority. The believer has spiritual authority. So I wanted to share that with you today because I think it's part of our Christian walk. You know, it, it's not preached a lot, and, uh, but I think it, it needs to be part of our arsenal that we understand that God has given us power uh, over the powers of darkness in the name of Jesus Christ and not man on ourselves. But let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your power and your mercy. And we thank you, God, that... Uh, that you've given us uh, power uh, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And Lord, we don't want to abuse that power, but we want to be aware of it, that we have it, 
uh, in our arsenal of things that you've put on us. Lord, you said you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And having spiritual authority is part of those all things that you've given us to have a victorious life. And as the Lord, we just uh, help us to walk that out and to balance that out in our lives. And uh, Father, we pray for our nation right now, God. It's just going through a horrible time of division. And uh, we just pray for your angels uh, to surround these candidates, uh, uh, President Trump and President Biden, Lord, that you would protect them and keep them from uh, the powers of darkness trying to destroy and to kill them. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, and we have a great Bible study on Wednesday night.